come back too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is the point of this show really to misuse Bible verses? Well, of course it is, because this is. <laughs> you stop that. Stop what? Stop <laughs> leaving your sentences open ended. Every time you do, the audience screams. <laughs> Helen, do you think you can win this game? Oh, yes, I know I can, because God said in Jeremiah 29, 11 that he has plans for me to prosper. <laughs> That's right, he did. <laughs> you just can't say that. Sure she can, because she just did. And she gets another 29.11 points. I don't even know who Jeremiah is, but the verse is on my coffee mug. <laughs> Lots more to come here on Twisted. But first, a message from this pastor. The message series, as you see, is called Twisted, where we're looking at some different scripture verses uh, that historically uh, and commonly in our culture, frankly, uh, get twisted. Some of the most twisted, some of the most popular, but most twisted verses that come out of the Bible. And, and, and sometimes they're twisted on purpose, sometimes they're twisted simply out of misunderstanding. Uh, they get misrepresented. It's not always an intentional thing as people twist these verses, but it, it, it's still nonetheless a misapplication. And so we want to look at those. And, and as I said, um, one of the most popular ones, one of the most well-known ones, I mean, you may have this on a wall at your house, or as the lady said, you probably have it on a coffee mug somewhere. Uh, it comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. It's one of the most quoted Bible verses that you will ever hear. And odds are you personally probably have some sort of story uh, related, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you have some sort of story related to this verse. And so, like I said, you might have a coffee mug, you might have it on um, a, a little decorative thing you hang on your wall or your office or, or whatever it is. Um, this is a popular, popular verse. And it's particularly popular this time of year as we enter into the season of graduation, right? So you will see this on all kinds of graduation cards. For high school graduates as we're sending them to college, for college graduates as we're sending them off into the world to the next chapter and stage of their lives, we put this verse on there. And, and that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, says this. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, or some uh, versions say plans for prosperity, and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. And it's, a, it's an amazing and, and, and popular and comforting and soothing and a very hope-filled verse, right? And what I want to do today, though, is um, show you that there's actually maybe a little bit more to this verse than what a lot of us understand just on the surface. And I want to help bring some context to it and maybe reframe it for us a little bit as we talk about it here today, that, that perhaps by the time we're done, you might actually even love this verse more when we're done with it than we did to begin with. And so Jeremiah 29, 11, God has plans to prosper you, Right? For your welfare, plans for your welfare. Let's look at that verse in the context and see what it is that we can see, if we can get a broader understanding of what that means. Now, in verse 1 of Jeremiah 29, <coughs> excuse me, verse 1 gives us the context for this passage. Jeremiah is sending a letter to a group of exiles, okay? And, and these exiles, uh, these people who, who had been exiled out of Jerusalem, uh, are the surviving elders. They're the, the priests and the prophets and, and, and a large group of people. See, there was this neighboring country and the king, whose name was Nebuchadnezzar, had gone in and taken captive a whole bunch of the Israelites out of Jerusalem and taken them back to where he lived and enslaved them, okay? They'd carried them off into exile. And so that's the context in which Jeremiah is writing to them. And the reason that Nebuchadnezzar was able to come into Jerusalem, okay, this is God's chosen people in God's chosen city. It shouldn't have been that way. But the reason that Nebuchadnezzar is able to basically waltz right down the streets of Jerusalem, gather up all the people that he wants to take with him, he takes all kinds of resources. He grabs the smart people, the, the, the important government people who know how to build streets and, and, and the scholars and all kinds of very valuable people. Then he grabs the big strong men who can do a lot of heavy lifting and labor and he takes them and he transports them to his city. And the reason he's able to do this is the Israelites, the, the, the people in, in Jerusalem specifically had, had just disregarded their relationship with God. 
Um, they had blatantly rebelled against God. They had disobeyed God. They had turned to false gods. They had turned to other idols. And so God basically says to them, because of your bad behavior, because of your sinfulness, for the next 70 years, you're going to be under the control of the Babylonians. You're going into exile. And if you've read the Old Testament, um, you know, if you've read your Old Testament, that this is a common theme, right? This is a common pattern for the Israelites. They, as God's chosen people, God specifically said, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, we're going to have a special relationship, nobody else gets this special relationship, you're my folks, right? And then he blesses them, right? Special treatment. They get the special stuff. But if you've read the Old Testament, you know time and time and time again, what happens with the Israelites? They lose their way. They, they quit paying attention to their relationship with God. They, they start taking on the gods of neighboring countries and other people. They start intermarrying and mingling and doing all the things that God said, don't do. And as a result of that, they begin to drift away from worshiping God. And they start chasing these other gods and they quit chasing after the one true Yahweh God. And, and as a result of this, God is angered and God judges them. And so they end up spending a season, therefore, um, because of their disobedience, they end up spending this season paying for their sins until their God lovingly, graciously comes and returns them to their place and restores them to relationship with him. Now, if you've read your Old Testament, this, this, this amazes me, at least as a pastor, you would think eventually they would wise up, right? You would think, if I'm an Israelite, I would read my history. I'd see, you know, wisdom, right? What wisdom is. Wisdom is being smart enough to learn from somebody else who wasn't smart enough, right? Wisdom is learning from somebody else's mistakes. So you would think, as a good Jew, you'd be looking back and going, oh, yeah, this is where all my ancestors screwed this up, right? I'm not going to do that. But they did. Again and again and again and again and again as you read the Old Testament. Over and over and over again, they chase after false gods and they chase just wildly away from the one God who truly loves them. Now, it would be kind of easy for us to get really critical of them for that, right? Right? It's easy for us to look back and go, you silly Israelites, right? Sinful people. But the truth of the matter is, we're a lot like them, aren't we? They keep on failing. They keep on wandering away from God. Yet, before I judge them, I need to examine my own heart a little bit too, right? And realize that, oh, hold on a second. I might kind of be just like them. Because we too keep sinning. We, keep, we too keep wandering from God. We too keep pursuing other things. We too keep needing God's grace. So before we're quick to judge, keep in mind, we're more like them than we really want to admit. Now back to our verse. When we read this verse, what we need to understand is two things. There are two different types of promises given to us in Scripture. There are specific promises, and there are general promises in the Bible. There are specific promises that are very specifically made and given to a specific group of people. And then there are general promises that's given to all of us, right? That are, that are true regardless of place or time. And the truth of the matter is, Jeremiah 29, 11 is a specific promise. A specific promise made to Jewish exiles. How many of you are Jewish ex exiles here today? You know, if you're watching this video later, no fewer than zero hands went up, right? We're not Jewish exiles, are we? None of us. And we need to understand that this promise 
is not specifically given to us, but specifically given to a nation. And, and the problem is, for me, when I read this verse, that God has plans for my welfare, God has plans to prosper me, right? I, I, as I used to read this, I used to think that the, the you there in that passage was me, right? Why? Because I want to be the main character in the Bible, right? I want everything that happens in the Bible to be about me. I want it to be about me. And here's where the problem can creep into our theology if we're not careful. If we read this as being about me, that God is going to prosper me, that God is going to bless me, that no harm will come to me, then what happens? What happens when things don't go my way? What happens then when things get hard? What happens then when life happens? Because life is going to happen. It's going to wreck me if I think this promise is for me. But God, I prayed, right? But God, you promised blessing, and now this happened. But God, I prayed, and then I lost my job. But God, I, I prayed, and I lost my dad. God, I had this great guy, but then he dumped me. How can that be if I was promised prosperity and blessing and all that? If I make this verse about me, and the bad things of life begin to happen as they will, as we know, then I can arrive at a false conclusion that God is either impotent, that he doesn't exist, or he doesn't care. That's a problem. And so we start to wrongly believe that God is some sort of cosmic vending machine if we believe this promise is for us, that God is like a magical Coke machine that if I go up and I put the right amount of prayer in, or if I put the right amount of work in, if I put whatever it is that needs to be put in, if I put that thing in, then God has to give me what it is that I expected to receive. Right? That's a problem. Because essentially then, if that is the case, we have reduced God to our great cosmic butler, who is only there to do our bidding who's only there to do what it is we want, who's only there to serve and glorify us. But that's not what God is. That's not what God does. God's highest calling is not to serve us. He's already served us through Jesus. And he blesses us in so many ways. And ultimately, God here is not saying, what can I do for you? What can I do for your pleasure? Because instead, it is us who exist to bring him glory. And so that's why we have to be so careful. That's why we have to be careful not to read ourselves into a promise that wasn't given for us. Glad you came to church today, aren't you? Right? Now, before you go home and throw away that coffee mug with this verse on it, don't give up yet. Let's dig in a little bit deeper. Because while this verse may not be all about you, there's still power and truth all over in this passage. So back to the story. So as punishment for their disobedience, we're told the Israelites who have been taken into exile are going to live in captivity for 70 years. It tells us that in verse 10. 70 years, right? That's a long stinking time. How many of you remember getting in trouble as a kid? What are you, a bunch of like goody two-shoes here? <laughs> yeah, I got in a lot of trouble. My parents will someday come here and you can ask and my dad will tell you stories till you were tired of hearing them about the stupid things I did as a child and as a young adult and as an adult and everything else. He, he's very transparent about that. Thank you, Dad. Um, yeah, my dad's a good guy. But uh, 
70 years is a long time, and we all got in trouble as kids. We all got grounded as kids, right? And by the way, who named it grounding, right? That's a terrible name. Like, like the punishment naming committee that named it grounding, they failed us all. That's a horrible name. Grounded? What does that mean? But nonetheless, anyhow, we've been grounded before, right? I've been grounded before. I've been grounded more times. I can't even remember them all. I mean, I, I, I couldn't list them than times that I've been grounded. But have you ever been grounded for 70 years? Right? 70 years. And those who are there in captivity, just like us when we got grounded, they don't want to be there, right? When I was a kid, you get grounded away from TV. You didn't get to have TV. You get grounded to your room. You know, one, one time, oh, boy, my parents were angry. I didn't clean my room. And, and I mean, like for a long time, didn't clean my room. And after many, many, many warnings, while I was at school one day, they emptied my room of everything. I had a bed, some blankets and a pillow, and virtually nothing else. They had warned me. It, I can't really complain, right? And they had grounded me from all my toys and all my stuff because I wasn't being responsible to put stuff away. I've been grounded from cars. I've been grounded from activities. I've been grounded from everything you can get grounded from and probably stuff, that, they're still probably thinking of stuff to ground me from that they haven't figured out quite yet that I did back then, right? And the Israelites are effectively grounded for 70 years. But then comes verse 11 with its promise. And hear this, folks, because this is the good news. This is the good news that we all need to hear. God didn't abandon the Israelites to their sin. God didn't abandon them in their sin. Yes, there were consequences. But he continued to love them. Now back before I became a Christian, I became a Christian as an adult. Back before I knew Jesus, before I understood grace, this is where I personally got things wrong. I grew up in the church. My not knowing Jesus is nobody's fault but my own. It's my own hard-headedness and my own hard-heartedness. But I didn't understand what grace was which is ironic because I grew up in a church called Grace Lutheran Church, right? But I, I lived with this idea. I, I knew there was a God. I, I didn't ever doubt that there was a God. That wasn't really a question in my life. It was my relationship with that God. And I had in my head this idea that God was always out to get me, right? That God was always watching over my shoulder, waiting for me to screw up so that he could punish me for it. And I, I kind of lived with this mentality that, well, if then I could just hide my sins good enough, right? If I was just good enough at covering up my sins, if I was good enough at hiding my sins, if I was good enough to make sure nobody else would see my sins, maybe I'd be okay. And not only that, as long as I didn't sin as bad as those guys, right? As long as I wasn't as big of a sinner as them, maybe God will grade on a curve, right? You don't want to be at the tail end of that curve. You really don't want to be at the front end of that curve because then you don't have any fun. That's the way I thought anyhow. My fear of becoming a Christian was I wasn't ever going to have fun again, right? Some of you can relate. And so, I thought God was out to get me, waiting to punish me. But that's not how God works, is it? See, the Israelites, they had sinned. They had fallen short of God's expectation, and therefore they were living with the consequences. Exile, banishment, captivity, no self-rule, no freedom, no worship in Jerusalem with God's chosen people for 70 long years. But as I said, God didn't abandon them to their sin. He loved them. He even blesses them in the midst of their punishment. 
God says to them, despite your sin, despite your disobedience, I'm going to bless you anyhow. You're going to live with the consequences. But within that, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm still looking out for your welfare to give you a future, to give you some hope. Sounds a lot like the New Testament, actually, doesn't it? You ever heard somebody suggest that that Old Testament God, right, was different than the New Testament God? Like the Old Testament God is that, that, that angry God, right? Vengeance and war and floods and slaying of Philistines, right? And then the New Testament God, loving God, the give peace a chance God, the washing your feet God, the turn the other cheek God, the I'll pick you up when you get down God, right? It's one God, folks. The same God, Old and New Testament. And God is blessing the sinful people in the middle of where they were in the process of restoring them. Romans 5.8. Many of you know this verse, right? Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. Question for you. Did Jesus die for you before or after you stopped sinning? It's a trick question. You haven't stopped sinning. Right? Anybody here stop sinning yet? Okay. Good that we got that out in the open. You're all hypocrites. You're all sinners. Now that we're clear on that. In the middle of the mess that you've made of your life, God is loving you anyhow. Right? In the middle of your sin, in the middle of your disobedience, God is still reaching out to you, to each and every one of us, reaching out to reconcile us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. A lot like what is going on here in the Old Testament, 600 years before Christ was even born. Same God, same love, same pursuit of broken, sinful people. Now, there were consequences for the disobedient Israelites. God wasn't going to restore them immediately. And God wasn't going to bless them nor prosper them in the ways that they probably would have chosen for themselves, right? And that can still be hard for us to hear today. We want it our way, right? Right? Burger King tells us, you can have it your way, right? That's what they tell us. And that's what we want from God. We want this blessing from God. We want healing. We want that job. We want that relationship. We want that car, that boat, that boy as a sign that God loves us and cares for us, right? Because then if God gives us that thing that we want, that we think we need, then of course we'll feel like we've been blessed because we got what we want. But that's not what the Bible promises. That's not how God works. Does God have a plan for us? Does God have a, a purpose for us? Absolutely. Ephesians 1.11. God works everything in conformity with a purpose according to his will, Right? God works all things to bring about good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Yes, God has a purpose and a plan for us. Does God have plans to bless his people? Absolutely. Now the Bible says we're to interpret scripture with other scripture, right? God is a good God, a loving God, a good father God who loves to give good gifts to his children. So does that loving Father God love to prosper his people? All the time. Whenever you get cancer, can you still have hope? Absolutely. Amen. All day long. 
We have the hope that God uses doctors and medical technology. We have the hope that God hears our prayers and works miracles. We have the hope that Jesus is bigger than any problem in our life, including cancer. We have hope in a God who says, all things are possible with me. And so we have hope. And whenever life begins to fall apart a little bit, and you begin to think, well, I don't know if I could overcome this. Or maybe, maybe you messed up and you find yourself thinking, I don't know if God could ever use me again. After what I did? I don't know. I don't know if I'm still on the team. Let me assure you, you have a hope and you have a future. We serve a God who works in all things to bring about good. And he will use it for your future. He will take where you messed up and do something in you to help you conform to the image and likeness of his son Jesus. You're not finished yet, folks. If you're not dead, you're not done. God still has something for us. Now this verse is not specifically for us. But there is truth in it. Embrace it. And then here's the key. Don't stop at verse 11. Don't stop there. Because the verse that really should go on your coffee mug comes from 12, 13, and 14 right after it. Which those become a general promise for all of us. Why? Because it's consistent with the other promises that we find throughout Scripture. And that is this. God says this. It says, after this promise he makes to the exiles, he says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. <coughs> God says no matter what it is that we are going through, I'm going to be there for you. Whenever you call on me, I will hear you. Whenever you cry out, I am there. No matter what you do, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I am always with you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, right? Why? Because you are with me. Because God is with me. You will rod, Lord, your staff, they comfort me. You never leave me. The main point of this passage is not that God delivers us from our trials. It's not that God always gives you exactly what it is that you want. It's that God will never leave you and never forsake you, even in your times of sinfulness. He's more concerned with your eternity than anything else. And he is always and absolutely good through and through. Therefore, our faith does not rest on what he does or does not do. Because it rests instead on what he has already done for us, which is enough on the cross. So if you want this passage to be one of your favorites, just move down the page a little bit. Sink in a little bit deeper and a little bit further so that you will know that no matter where you are spiritually, if you seek God, you will find Him. And if you find Him, you will be restored to Him. And it is there and within that you will find the blessing of God. Let's pray.